Freaking the Blitz! And I'm so happy uh, to come at you guys with some great information uh, about where the league's headed and, and the draft analysis of what happened already in March. I think I believe it was March 23rd, March 24th, where we started season two uh, of the uh, season two draft for the MBL, and uh, I cannot wait. The Blitz is here to give you guys league information day in, day out. Uh, about what how leagues uh, progressing, ranking systems, uh, team analysis, draft picks, free agency waiver pickups, all these things uh, that also work in conjunction with uh, waiver focus uh, for the uh, MBL. And I'm so happy to come at you guys with some great stuff. So today we're going to be going over a few things um, in the league. Uh, specifically with the draft, and we're going to go through uh, each conference. So there are two conferences, the Kanto Conference and the Johto Conference. Uh, we have some brand new branding teams, a part of the MBL, and we've actually increased our team load from 10 teams now to 12 teams, so with a higher competition ceiling. Uh, we have a lot of rookies who, uh, this is the first time in a Pokemon League setting, but we also have over half of the, uh, of the last year's cast uh, or, or teams and coaches coming back for the season two of the MBL. And so we're going to go through each one. We'll start off with Kanto first. Uh, and we have a ranking system. We have a grade, right, from uh, F being the worst, A being the best. And then at the very end, we have our best of draft. And so uh, we'll get right into it. Uh, we have a rookie team coming in here. A uh, rookie coach, I should say, but a veteran team we have Pewter City. Now, if you look at the, the, the graphic here, we see that last year within season, the Pewter City was a measly, measly 2-8, and eight, right? And this is the in-season record. Uh, but we have a new coach. So it was Chris Tenney, uh, but now we have a Lex Richards coming in as the Pewter City coach. Uh, she is a rookie to the MBL, but we're hoping that we can integrate her into the uh, system, and she will be a huge asset. However... <laughs> when we look at the draft in and of itself, uh, uh, instead of drafting 10, we draft 9. Her draft isn't the greatest. And we'll get into that a little bit. So if you see the highlighted marks are your four, uh, first four picks. Now your first four picks have a lot of how your team's going to really move and how it's going to operate in league matches. This is where you'll mostly find your cores and your one solid sweeper or a mixture of two sweepers and so on and so forth. With Lex though, it didn't go as planned with her first pick being Charizard, uh, which most people weren't expecting to go in the first round. In fact, if we're looking at it from a realistic perspective, Charizard doesn't go until like the fifth or sixth round. So she essentially got a fifth and sixth uh, round pick in her first round pick. And so that's a, it set her off to a really bad start. And as you look, she picked up a great pick in Arcanine, very defensive, right? Very defensive. Rocky Helmet, Intimidate, right? And kind of haste people out with Roar. Um, but as you'll start seeing after her Chandelure pick in number three, which is a great ghost type, mind you, great ghost type, we have three fire types. Three fire types in round one, two, and three. And there's a clear water weakness here that cannot be avoided, that you cannot ignore. And it's something that in, in an MBL draft setting is going to be something that really uh, is a weakness. Not, not so much like for a showdown, I'm uh, doing some scrimmages, but Pewter City has to get this under control where now... The, their entire team, their first half, all your top four or top three draft picks are weak to one specific typing. So potentially one Mon can wipe out your top three picks. And that's not good. So the, her core is just everywhere. And then you'll see that pick uh, pick four. It was actually a good pick. I like I liked it. I'm surprised it actually dropped down, which is Surfetched. Surfetched is a phenomenal pick, mainly because with the big leak, there are a lot of crits that can happen here. So Peter City is going to look to be very offensive with both Chandelure and Surfetch. And as we go down the list, though, and this is interesting, when you look at uh, picks five through nine, though, the problem we have with the first four picks was typing issues. And here we have the same thing. There's little synergy with the Pokemon she got, and there's no type diversity, right? And we see Conkledur, Pangoro, Melodic, Beware, and Phalanx, all of which are decent mods, except for League Format, when you have, out of those uh, five picks, four of them are fighting, and one water type in Melodic. Melodic dropping to seven is a big pick, and so congrats to her. Phalanx is also kind of a niche one, where he has an Omni Boost, but, and Conkledur is a good one, but Pangora and, uh, Pangora and Beware, on top of Conkledur and Phalanx, 
doesn't make any sense to me. And so when you look at her draft grade, it's going to be an F. In fact, I would go on to say this is probably the worst draft of the entire league this season. It's not the worst. I'll keep in mind, last year's uh, team, I think it was Celadon uh, with with coach uh, Kaylee Rutledge at the time before she was Kaylee Shook. Um, Worst draft. She went for an Evie draft. And that was great. If you remember in Sun and Moon uh, meta, it was much faster pace. Uh, the the diversity and and, and just skill set was way higher, right? Here with this, without without the ultra beasts, without legendaries, you know, it's kind of stripped down. The, the the speed tiers are a lot slower, and Peter City did, uh, is is not in the worst of positions, but this is easily the worst uh, worst worst draft in totally. After that, we have Saffron City. With uh, originally was my team from last uh, from last season, right? Uh, we went ten and two in season. There's a couple dropouts. We did not uh, put that towards the record, so it could have been anywhere from ten and four to twelve and two. And so there, there, there's kind of like this varying degree of what it could have been. Uh, but the reality is, Saffron City uh, parted ways with Nathaniel Shook, and they are going to go with a rookie in Corbin. Uh, and Corbin, this is his first time as uh, MBL. Uh, coach and first time ever doing league format, so this is going to be something different. Whereas Lex was already a, a, attuned to battling, has done showdown here and there. Corbin has not, and so this is where it's going to be a little funky. Um, so also I'll give a little scoop in draft, he had an auto draft majority, if not all of his team. So this is an auto draft team, and so it's not it's not like he had any say on it. It just took top lines, but he got uh, I think it was the third third pick in the entire in the overall draft, Corbinite. Then he picked up Manda Buzz, Hatterin, and Dugtria. Now, you can already see from those top four, oh, he's going to be phasing people out left and right. Has great, has some decent hazard control, can utilize Trick Room, and has great debuffs. Great debuffs with knockoff and other stuff. The, the issue that we're seeing here, very similar to that of Lex, is you have two flying types. They're bulky, but the speed. The speed's a problem because if you go even beyond Dugtrio, you have Galarian Corsola. Jellicent, Obstagoon, Avalug, and Glalie. These are all great Pokemon individually, but if they're all on the same team, your team is slow. It is so slow. And so if you don't utilize how to read right with Trick Room, you're going to have a rough time. Now, picks I do love. I do love this. I love Obstagoon. He can debuff with, with uh, ob, uh, Obstruct. He has a couple other moves in there that can debuff other Pokemon and really really slow down any type of momentum the opposing team has. Corsola is uh, immensely tanky. And then Corviknight, you don't you can bulk up sets. You can do, do uh, defog stuff. Mandibus is uh, primarily knockoff. And defog you, you can, uh, defog, you can do a multitude of things with that. And then lastly, Avalog with Body Press, one of the highest defensive totals of defensive stats in the actual game. It This is not a bad team you add Doug trio and you have some ground uh, coverage as well the issue is if you are a new player this isn't the team you want right this is not the team you want and you can see here there it's not it, it's not fast it's in, in fact very slow there are no legitimate sweepers except for Doug trio and maybe Corviknight Right, Hattering has the ability to, so we, we kind of lumped her in there, get kind of give uh, Corbin kind of some like, hey, yeah, he's she's a sweeper, but you have to utilize, utilize Trick Room, and if you got Mons that can utilize Taunt, Hattering isn't going to be as good as you think. Now, if the Trick Room does come up, if they, if he predicts it and utilizes Hattering well enough, this is a scary team because the Trick Room set up, Corsola, Jellison, Obstacle, Avala, Glalie. Uh, Mandibus, Corviknight, and, and except for Doug Drew, they're all moving first. So, uh, but overall, given the fact of uh, it's a, it's a rookie team, the draft there's a little to no synergy. There's some de- there's a lot of debuff, but there's a lot of clean. There's no switch initiative and all that stuff. It's a D rating. It's not as bad as Pewter. In fact, it's leagues better than Pewter. So I want to c- really make this clear that the F in, with Pewter's draft and this D with Saffron are on totally different spectrums. That D is a godsend in comparison to what Pewter City did. Uh, next, we have Viridian City, and now uh, this is a great one. Uh, Viridian City last uh, last season uh, in in the actual uh, seasonal play was four and nine. Uh, it was kind of middle of the road. They kind of uh, fell into some issues, but it's a new coach. It's not Cheyenne anymore. No, 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 no. It is Chris 
Tenney coming from moving from Pewter to Viridian City Football Club, and I cannot wait to see what he does. Viridian has been a staple in the Pokemon uh, League, and I cannot wait. And he, again, the mastermind himself, is going to bust out with that Sandstorm team, utilizing x drill And instead of going T-Tar, he's going to hit Powdon, uh, and with Gastrodon, Reuniclus, Duraludon, Dreadnought, Flapple, Araquanid, and Pinchurchin. I can't say it right. Hopefully that's right. Uh, hopefully that's good. I love this draft and with him already having MBL experience it makes that it makes this team and his performance arguably going to be better you can predict it to be better you can expect him to utilize the team far more than his T-Tar Sandstorm set up with extra last season and because there's no legendary and because the speed tiers are so slow in this meta Excadrill is one of the scariest Pokemon in this game now obviously when you look at this team though uh, the, the sandstorm ability it will also boost rock types didn't utilize that except for dreadnought dreadnought's gonna get a real big boost from the sandstorm and they have a lot of sustain with regenerator on reuniclus gastrodon with storm drain if he wants to flip it up with any opposing weather uh, weather teams duraludon's massive uh, and araquanid has the ability and even flapple has the ability to regain health through the use of giga drain and other uh, leech life or leech seed and all stuff so Honestly, when you look at this entire team, it's great. It has good sustainability, utilizing Sandstorm effectively to boost their offensive potency. Uh, but there is limited coverage as there's a lot of water rock, right? There's a lot of ground types. Even though he has coverage, it's not, and it's not nearly as bad as, say, like a Saffron City or a Pewter City. Uh, the reality is that there's limited coverage. And so you, if you come into contact with a grass-type Pokemon, it's going to be really hard. I think that's where he picked up Flapple uh, and, and Reuniclus to really phase out those issues. Uh, even though they are slow, the Sandstorm's going to buff them out, but that is a knock on them in limited co coverage. But look to Viridian City, especially, uh, uh, what was it? Especially Chris switching from a new team and being able to understand the meta better uh, to really work with this team and really make a push for playoffs, right? Out of the Kanto region, out of the six teams, he's in the dead center and he's number four. And he has the best opportunity to really push forward and make a name for himself with Viridian City. And so I am super happy about that. Uh, next is a rookie, okay? This is Fuchsia City. Last year, they were 9-4 and four under the... Uh, uh, under the guys, not under the guys, but under the coaching uh, prowess of Eric Pass, who went on to actually be uh, fourth in the league, right? Uh, losing to, I believe, Cerulean City uh, in the playoffs in the in the conference finals. And so, uh, what I really want to paint a picture here is that uh, even though he leaves, the coach they're picking up, even though he's a rookie. Never done Pokemon battling competitive before. He's a fast learner, and you can tell by the way he drafted this. I want to look at this team real fast. Uh, first round draft pick is Dracovish. There are other p things that were on the line. I got Darmanitan, uh, Draco Zolt, Aegis Flash was there. But one thing he told me, uh, he's like, Nate, I, I know how to play Dracovish. It, it, it makes it, uh, it makes it more fun to play, and I can really trip up some people because again, a vicious Ren moving first with Strong Jaw is insane and it was already in talks to be banned in smoke on OU so he picked up Dracovish then he picked up Ditto and when you talk to him about why he picked up Ditto it's to help with setup mons if he doesn't like this the, uh, what's going on across the way on the field right uh, with his opposing team he can throw out Ditto allows him to copy all the stats and with choice scarf it then allows him to then take advantage of those buffs more effectively and be able to really put his opponent in a horrible situation you also have a debuffer in Santa Scorch, which he utilized greatly and has Appleton in his tank. So he has a fire, water, grass core already early on uh, within his top four picks. And they are great picks, even though Ditto is ranked in like, I think, tiered PU or maybe even like RU, right? The, the, issue, the issue with other teams, are, what they're going to find is playing around Ditto is super hard to do because you never know when it's going to come out. Then you add Mamoswine, Toxicroak, which are two massive sweepers and or, and or revenge killers. Mamoswine's damage output is insane. Toxicroak's ability to use dry skin to soak up water, gain HP for sustainability, and then hit tenfold with Sucker Punch and with Brick Break Breaking Screens. This is a good team from pick one to six. This is a scary team. And then you add Eldegoss, which is a good uh, hazard player, right? Being able to utilize spores and other stuff. And then you add Sigilith, 
which is insanely hard to, to, to deal with, with the flying second type and the, and, and the moves that he, he's presented with. And then Poltergeist being that last minute sweeper with, I believe, cell, uh, Shell Smash or something like that, um, allowing him to really break out <laughs> and be able to utilize buff speed, buff special attack. And Poltergeist now, now becomes a kind of a, a, a niche uh, sweeper. And so he has the ability to really fluctuate within the meta, be able to utilize his Pokemon and, and adapt them to certain situations. Fuchsia Cities is, is an incredibly aggressive team. Okay? Very aggressive. Uh, the team synergy within this, uh, in, in this uh, team is great. There's good type coverages. There's good typings. There's a lot of uh, type variety in regards to moves and different ways you can set up the Mons. However... It is physical oriented, right? Most of these mods are going to be hitting physically. Toxicroak, Mammoth Swine, potentially Appleton. Doesn't we're not, not sure. Senna Scorch for sure. Dracovich for sure, right? And so a lot of these mods are going to be set towards a more of a physical playstyle. So if you got really defensive tanks, it's going to be very hard for Future City to come in without bringing a Sigalith a Poltegeist, or an Eldegoss, right? And so his back his back three, his seven, eight, and nine, are going to be really used because he doesn't have the ability to attack on the, spe uh, on, the, on the special attacking side. So it gives teams like Viridian City with Gastrodon. It gives, it gives opportunities for Duraludon to show up there and be like, hey, I'll take a shot. I'll, ta I'll, ta I'll take the hit, right? Uh, and so within the Kanto Conference, the Future City of Viridian, uh, Viridian City uh, kind of ongoing rivalry is going to be really big. And I expect these two to really be fighting for it. But if we look at just team setup, you have to give it to Fuchsia City. But if you look at experience and battle experience, you have to give it to Viridian. So, so Uriah Lerner and Chris Tenney are going to have this ongoing struggle within the season, uh, uh, amid this 11-week season, where I'm not really sure if Viridian City comes up on top or Fuchsia City. But all in all, uh, this draft from Fuchsia City is uh, rated as a B. Uh, I love the aggressive teams in this, in this league, and he understands the speed tiers to a certain degree with Sucker Punch and Priority. So great draft for Fuchsia. Uh, next is, and surprisingly, it's going to be... Pallet Town, they, re they, they, they kept their coach uh, on the team, and Eric Gressler uh, finished uh, first, right? He, he got the t uh, first ever inaugural NBL um, League championship and beat Cerulean. He went into last season as a wild card going into the playoffs at an 8-5 and five season record. This, it was unheard of, and his comeback, how he did everything, was insane and if you haven't I would encourage you to really watch this season and see what he does his draft was a B okay he are he set up immediately for a rain setup so he knew that he was the last pick of the draft I want to pick up Sykes and Pelipper and immediately have my rain team right immediately have swift swim seismitoad and be able to hit for massive amounts of damage along with Pelipper not only sitting in the rain but setting up tailwind and phase people in and out this is huge right uh, that first two picks set the tone for the rest of the draft where people are like oh crap we got to really think about weather teams we got to really think about team synergy because the reality is the weather synergy on this team is insane. And on top of that, if you look at his bottom picks, right, you have Galar we uh, Galarian Weezing and the last pick in Umbreon. And this is a known core within Smogon with UU and, uh, and it's insanely hard to get through. Galarian Weezing with a, with a fairy and poison type uh, typing. And then you have uh, a dark type in Umbreon, but the way they're so bulky, it's going to be super hard in conjunction with Caparaja and Gudra. Eric Dressler never ceases to amaze me because Gudra is a great pick for a lot of grass mods who want to come in there, right? Being able to use, utilize Gudra's ability to say, nah, it's a grass move, I'm, I'm good, right? Gudra was an insane pick. Then be able to phase out a lot of those grass uh, or a lot, of, a lot of the threats to his team with Galarian Weezing and usually neutral with Umbra and shutting down Prankster sets. Like, his back five picks are great. The only time where I would say it's probably kind of weird is going to be with that Vicavolt pick. And then with the top four, Rillaboom, I'm not really sure where they 
where he was, what he was doing with that. Now, in later discussions, we learned that he picked the Brillo Boom to try to set up a water grass fire core, but he says as the draft progressed, uh, progressed and he noticed fire types were dropping, dropping off, he kind of was stuck with that Brillo Boom pick. So look, look to see if Brillo Boom's actually going to be present in the team. I imagine halfway through the season as we approach trade, dread, uh, trade dread, uh, deadline and uh, just free waiver uh, wire pickups, that Brillo Boom might not be in that team lineup, right? Uh, I would look to see if he can trade uh, because I think Rillaboom for other teams is something really important, especially with some of his moves that debuff other Pokemon. Look to Rillaboom being a primary, uh, ha having a primary role, whether it's on this team or another team who's willing to trade. Uh, so, again, Team Cores is great. You also have the Seismitoad, Pelipper, and Cloyster, which for some teams, I don't think people realize this, is going to be a team destroyer. Right, if you if you switch in on a cloister and he gets a free uh, shell smash and he's able to boost along with King's Rocker and the and Skill Link, there's going to be a really rough time for people to counteract that, even from one right with Rock Blast and Ice Skill Spear. This is this is a mon I don't want to mess with. Right, I don't want to mess with a cloister and I want to shut it down as quickly as possible. But given how tanky he is, it's a two shot guarantee. So he's able almost freely to have one shell smash right out the gate. And so people have got have got to prepare for this cloister. All in all, Palatine has a really amazing team. The type coverage is a little wonk, again, because it's so, uh, it's really tied to that weather play. Uh, and then you got speed, t speed tiers, which, eh, it's not, it's not the fastest. A lot of them are set up immediately, but uh, if you look at the way it's set up, it looks like he's going to be a stalled wall team. And I look forward to seeing if Palatown can remake that match that they had in the first season of the MBL. Uh, lastly, for the Kanto region, and we'll leave it for our first episode of the Blitz, we have Cinnabar Island, okay? Uh, they retained their coach from last year with Philip Shook. Uh, last year, they, uh, last season, they were nine and four going into season and made it to the conference championships on, the, I believe, the East Side, the East Conference, right before we switched it up. His draft is insane. I know it says he made fourth last season. He was actually third. I want to clarify that real fast. But his draft is insane. The top four picks are phenomenal, right? They're insanely good. Already creating a a, a steel uh, uh, with a steel fairy core um, with the dragon type uh, on the, on the later end, insanely well, right? Aegislash Slash dropping to the second to last, uh, third to last pick in the draft is nothing to scoff at. In fact, I'm, I'm looking at some other, and we'll talk about that in the Jodo side because Jodo had some really funky picks. But the how Aegislash Slash dropped down that far, we'll still never, I'll never understand. And you pair that with a Toxapex on the second round, on the come up on the snake. Oh my gosh, already Cinnabar has a great setup defensively if he wants to play that. Then you add a hazard, a, a, a status inflictor in Grimstone with prankster sets? Oh my gosh, and he can switch into a bulk upset. The top three is insane. And then people sleep on Halucha's speed tiers and the ability to have massive damage outputs with power herbs and other stuff. Then you look at his back five. Which I, I th this is why it's a it's a plus. I mean, we give him an A rating. Is that his team depth is insane, right? N five picks, Snorlax with thick fat, one of the biggest biggest tanks in the game, and the ability to recover with rest and do sleep talk, and so much more. You have Haxorus that base I think ninety five or ninety seven speed going on the sixth round. Giving your sweeper the, uh, the ability to dragon da D dance and go right into the enemy team at 147 base attack? Unbelievable. Already paired up with Aegislash and Grimstone. That's insane. Then with your hazard setter in Bronzong, a steel and psychic type, similar to that of Metagross? Dude. And then you on the very end, you allow him to pick up Whimsicott, a Grass Fairy Prankster, a, another Prankster, a Grass and Fairy type, and then you have a Magic Bounce Espeon, which you could run Magic Bounce, or you can make him as a special sweeper. This team has it all on the physical side and on the special side, and can face people out with Defog and a wide variety of things, not to mention an Espeon copycat set if he runs it right after Grimmsnarl. This, with bulk up, or a wide variety of things. This is a solid team. They have great hazard control. They have two cores going on from both their top draft and their bottom draft with Snorlax, right? Then they have a great team synergy with Prankster and Switch Initiative, right? And on top of that, with team depth, depth, it is a great 
team. I don't think he's dropping anyone, and I'd be shocked if he traded anyone. In fact, the only trade I could see is potentially Bronzong, which is already great for people who don't have good hazards. So look to him to trade Bron Bronzong for a, honestly, a, a top six, the top five pick in the draft uh, for people who are struggling in that in in that field of hazards or just taking this. Honestly, Cinnabar has one of the greatest teams in the league, and look for them in the Kanto region to really shine the greatest. They are my favorite going into the, going into the league as Kanto's number one seed going into the playoffs, and we'll see if they're willing to take the number. Uh, if they're able to take the number one seed overall. Okay, so this has been the Blitz. I'm so glad you joined us today. Uh, for uh, the NBL Season 2 kickoff with some draft analysis, I'm your host, Nathaniel Shook, and we are so glad you're here. We'll catch you later when we go over the Johto League's draft analysis. You all take care, and I'm out.